Hi everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today and thank you so much WCN for having us here at the Virtual Expo um, this year. And my name is Louisa and I'm from Marasat here in Malaysia where we work to study and protect marine mammals. I just wanted to start my presentation today with this video um, that shows these magnificent Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins because this is really what it's about. This is, these are the animals that brought me to where I am today and that has brought me today into your screen to talk to you about um, the work that we do. And it's, it's a, been a childhood obsession, a lifelong dream that uh, I get to work with dolphins today. So as a kid, uh, I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be a dolphin scientist and conservationist. And I found that it was difficult to find information about marine mammals in Malaysia back in the day. And so I decided that I needed to change that and I needed to go and seek knowledge and come back to uh, build up on this field. And my parents were very supportive, but they were a bit nervous because I was essentially sailing into the unknown. And all I had to guide me were my hopes, my dreams and my passions. But years passed, I went off and I studied and after 10 years returned to Malaysia as a trained dolphin scientist, finally ready to build this field um, of research and conservation in my country. And one of the first stumbling blocks that I found was that never mind conservation issues, but that people were completely unaware that there are whales and dolphins in Malaysia. I often got asked, there are whales and dolphins in Malaysia? And so I thought to myself, this has to change. Something needs to be done. And I, you know, before I even think about uh, doing more for marine mammals, we need to do something to change this uh, lack of information because that leads to indifference. And when people are indifferent, they don't care. And when they don't care, they don't respond and they don't react for conservation. The other issue that I found was that um, because in our national language, Bahasa Malaysia, dolphins are called ikan lumba lumba and whales are called ikan paus. So the word ikan actually means fish. So that's when I realized that, oh, people actually think these animals are just fish. And so fortunately for me, um, not too long after I returned home, I met this guy here, his name is Firo, and we found that we have a shared vision for the uh, conservation of marine mammals. And together we uh, decided that we would go on to establish Marset in 2012. And here you can see some of the species that we work with, which are also some of the most frequently um, encountered species in our coastal waters. So together, Farrell and I intended for, intend for Marset to be uh, a place where we bridge the gap between science, policy and decision-making, as well as the general public. And it's a place where having realized our dreams uh, of doing this work, we wanted it to be also a platform for young Malaysians to be able to realize their dreams uh, working with marine mammals. And finally, of course, Maraset was established so that we could make an impact for the protection of marine mammals and their habitats here in Malaysia. In the early years, it was mostly just Firo and myself working hard round the clock trying to do all the legwork to build up the portfolio of marine mammals in our country as well as to start filling in the knowledge gaps and the answering some fundamental questions about marine mammals in our waters. But very fortunately over the years we started picking up uh, you know a few people that I've been so proud to train and mentor and guide and, and travel together on this journey. Uh, you can see that they're predominantly uh, young Malaysian women. I call this the dream team. This is our core team. And usually I'm the face of Maraset where I'm telling people about what Maraset does, what Maraset is. But today I want to take the opportunity to introduce a member of our core team. We're so proud of her. Uh, she's recently become a WCN scholar and so to tell you more about Maraset and what we do uh, and what it's been like in this journey to become a dolphin conservationist through her lens, let me introduce to you Sandra. Hi, I'm Sandra. Thank you WCN and everyone tuning in. First, let me give you a little bit of my background. I grew up on an island in Malaysia named Penang. For as long as I could remember, I've always been fascinated with the ocean. As a kid, I spent many weekends by the seaside, 
digging in sands and looking under the rocks. And when I turned seven, my dad brought me on my first ferry ride. On the ferry, he was telling me stories about the sea and the life under the water. And suddenly, something caught my attention. There were three dolphins that broke the water surface and quickly they dive under the water and just disappeared. One particular dolphin revealed its pink body. I was instantly spellbound. After that, I had dreamt of working with dolphins, swimming with dolphins. In fact, I remember telling my mom that I want to become a mermaid so that I can live with the dolphins. With that dreams in my head, I went on to pursue my marine pursue my undergrad in marine science in a local university. One day, a stranded dolphin was sent to my university to be taken care of. That was my first closest encounter with a wildlife dolphin. I felt a strong connection. So along with a few friends, we decided to take care of the dolphins to help it recover. Unfortunately, it died after several days, despite our effort. It broke my heart and that struck a chord with me. So I started looking information about marine mammals in Malaysia, trying to learn more about marine mammals and how I can help them. As, about, as I was looking, this is the video that I chanced upon. It's a video of Dr. Liza giving a talk in a TEDx event. I was inspired. So I wrote to her, expressed my interest and passion for marine mammals. And one thing led to another, that one email set off my conservation journey. Now, five years down the road, I'm living my childhood dreams. Unless, uh, except it's slightly different, I don't swim with dolphins and I look nothing like a mermaid. In fact, this is how we look on the boat. We cover ourselves up on sunny days as well as on rainy days. And as a kid, I'll imagine myself as a dolphin researcher. I'll look in clear blue waters and I'll see dolphins every day. But in fact, this is the kind of water conditions that I work in, turbid murky water. This dolphin, it was actually less than two meters from our research vessels. But when we dip our camera under the water, all we could see was just a shadow of dolphin. And most of the time, I spent hours or even days just looking at this vast emptiness. Sometimes it made me wonder, why am I doing this? But it's moments like this that reminds me why I'm doing, why I started. Every time, no matter how many times, every time when I see these dolphins, I fall in love all over again. These dolphins are so special to me. This is the same exact species that I saw on the ferry ride all those years ago. They are known as the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins. They are the only pink marine mammal in Malaysia. They are not always pink though. When they, were, when they are young, they are grey, and when they mature, they slowly turn pink. Humpback dolphin lives in shallow coastal water which overlaps with human activities. They love feeding on seafood that we humans love to eat, like fish, squid, and prawns. In Malaysia, they are considered as endangered species. All along the coast in Malaysia, they live in a few pockets of hundreds of animals. In one of our project sites, there are about 300 to 400 of them. But when you look at things on a bigger scale, in terms of density, there is actually less than one individual per square kilometer. And we are anticipating that these animals are at risk of declining. I've witnessed firsthand threats of, human, threats of human activities that pose to them. Let me tell you a story that happened three years ago in 2017. Like any other day on the boat, we were following a group of 30 traveling humpback dolphins. We were panning our camera at the dolphins, zooming into their dorsal fins, trying to capture that perfect shot. By looking at their dorsal fins, we can tell and differentiate each individual based on the shape of their dorsal fins and the pink pigmentations on their dorsal fins. It's basically like human thumbprints. Each dolphin has unique dorsal fin. 
For each individual that we successfully identified, we'll assign them a unique code name, and some were even given nicknames. For dolphins that were given nicknames are usually those that are very distinctive ones, the one that we can immediately identify when we see them, or for those that we've seen quite frequently, the so-called regulars. Here is one of our regulars, named after myself, Sandra. The team named her after me because we shared some similar traits. I tend to attract dramas and sometimes could be a little bit dramatic. So this dolphin, Sandra, when we first sighted her, it was being all dramatic, put on a lot of shows, leaping and bridging all over the places, as if it was trying to get our attention. So the, name decide, the team decided to name her after me. And next, we have Pink Step. The reason why we named Pink Step is because of the trailing edge of the dolphin, which resembles steps. She's one of the few animals that we first seen when we started our project back in 2010. She's a mother. We have seen her with at least three calves. Calves usually stays with the mother for two to three years. So in the span of our 10 years of project, We've seen her with three calves and that's how we could tell that she has been reproducing and has successfully delivered three babies. So going back to my story, we were out there at sea taking photographs of these traveling humpback dolphins and suddenly through my lens, I saw an odd looking dolphin. So I took a closer look and I was horrified by what I saw. It was a dolphin with a mutilated dorsal fins and a ring-looking object looped around its body. That object is part of a boat engine component. Somehow was discarded and ended up stuck on the dolphin's body. It has already cut deep through its dorsal fins and inflicted wounds on both sides of the dolphin's body. We named this individual Fan Belt. Fan Belt was unapproachable. We attempted to help, but every time when we approached Fan Belt, it just swam further away from our research vessel. We could never get close to it. We did not have any resources at the time, like manpower, there were only five of us on the boat. We did not have suitable research vessels to surround it and capture it, seeing how evasive it was. So we had no choice but to leave it. That broke our heart and left us very dispirited. The thing is, Fan Belt is not the only victim. We've seen other dolphins with similar disfigured dorsal fins and injured injuries. Especially comparing to early years of our research, we are seeing more of these injured dolphins. All these point towards the signs of impacts of human activities. These dolphins, they live in areas with high density of human activities. They have to put up with heavy vessel traffic, fishing pressure, which subject them to risk of boat strikes, underwater noise, net entanglement, or even bycatch, victim of bycatch. Here we have Flop, Lilith, Trax, and Grace. They are all once victim of human activities. And this is just a fraction of the many injured dolphins that we have catalogued. On top of that, we have pollution. We've seen dolphins with terrible skin condition external growth on their body. We've seen dolphins swimming in sea of trash. And every time when we go out to conduct our boat survey, we'll, we will be greeted with a stream of marine debris. And no matter how many times we've cleaned up, when we get there, we, when we get back out there again, we always see this endless debris. And let's not forget that Van Belt is a victim of marine debris. It completely reflects the problem of marine debris. After that boat survey in 2017, we had never seen Fan Belt. In our subsequent survey, every time we were out there, I was always hoping, hoping to see Fan Belt. But for two years, we hadn't seen him, seen it. So I started to think that it might have not made it. Until September 2019, we were working on this group of 100 do humpback dolphins. And suddenly, I saw a familiar looking dolphin. I turned to Louisa and I said this, I think I saw Van Belt. But the two of us, 
were skeptical at, of what I saw. So we were determined to track down this individual in the sea of 100 animals to confirm if it's phantom. After several attempts, we got the perfect shot. This are the photos. It's none other than Fanbell. In that moment, there is no word to express our happiness to, con to see Fanbell alive. And better still, free from the constricted ring. Fanbell is a true survivor. But Fanbell's story also shows me that there still remains gaps in providing help and rescue these dolphins. And we can't do this alone. We need more people to get on board in this conservation journey. Through our Marisat programs, we bring people to join this fight in protecting this species. Dr. Luisa mentioned this in the beginning of her slides. Lack of awareness, that is a problem. You can't love and champion for something if you don't know about it. Here is a video clip that were sent to us last year member, by the members of communities in Langkawi, one of our project sites. They encountered a dolphin with its snout entangled in fishing rope. They tried to help by releasing it. But from the video you can tell, they weren't handling the dolphins properly. Through our conversations with our boats keepers, we learned that these people they were not familiar with the animal. They weren't sure what they were handling with. They were afraid that the dolphin might bite them. The lack of awareness. It's instances like this that reminds me that we have so much more to do. And through our Marisat program, RH programs, we plan, we want to continue to educate and empower the local communities. We've conducted training sessions workshops with local communities like fishermen's, tour operators, even governmental agencies to create awareness and not only that, to build and train these people to be the leaders and guardians of these dolphins. We've also worked with school children, high schoolers, university students through our education program. We have conducted our education program with at least 3,000 students over the past few years. Our programs include indoor lectures and some interactive games and activities to teach them about the marine mammals and the marine environment and allow them to see the issues and importance of conservation. These kids, they have little or no exposure to nature and wildlife. And these kids that I'm talking about, they were born and grow up in the very island where we do our work. So last year, we finally managed to raise enough funds to bring a group of 50 school children out for a short field trip to show them about the dolphins and their habitats and to allow them to see the problem the dolphins are facing with their own eyes and of course allow them to connect with the nature and appreciate the beauty. At the end of the program, some of them came up to us requesting for photographs and some of them told us how inspired they were and they want to be part of this change, even asked us how they can contribute to conservation as a kid. That was, that gave me a sense of achievement. It was, I'm very fortunate because Marisat has provided me the platform to build and live my dreams. And now it's my turn to be able to give the same platform for this next generation of youth, especially for people my age who are starting out. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank WCN, all the WCN supporters, for giving me this opportunity to study and protect the species I loved and to train the next generation of youth in conservation in their own right. And with this, I'd like to pass to Dr. Luisa to wrap things up. Thank you, Sandra. I hope you enjoyed her talk. You can see here is a sea full of trash. And it was a reminder to us two weeks ago when we went back out to sea after months of lockdown that despite coronavirus bringing the world to a halt, it did not stop the threats to our dolphins and our whales and it did not stop the threats to um, wild, marine wildlife and that we needed to keep going um, even if everything has come to a halt. I want to share with you um, a story of what happened during lockdown. 
As we returned to the office after months of working from home, we were greeted by a warm, smelly welcome because the electricity had turned off while we were away and our freezer full of biological samples was a mess. Everything had gone bad. And so we had to spend the next few days cleaning up after this mess. And while we were um, elbow deep in gore, we received a phone call 450 kilometers away from us in our site that a dolphin had stranded dead. This was important for us to know why it died, but how were we going to go there to collect samples? And we managed to get a volunteer who lives there to assist us. And you can see here on the right, um, that was us on video call with this volunteer, walking him through step by step how to cut open a dolphin and how to grab the samples that we needed to try and understand what happened to it. I was reminded in that point that that was a great moment because our capacity building and our um, providing people, everyday Malaysians, the opportunity to partake in our work paid off because we were able to do this with the help of an everyday citizen. During coronavirus as well, it was a time of missed opportunity for us because we could not be out in the field and we could also not afford to buy the equipment that we need to monitor how a quieter sea when there's less people out there was good or bad um, for the animals that we work with. Technically, it would have been good for them, but because we could not sample, we do not know the actual answer. And so we hope that with your continued support, we will be able to do this sort of work very soon. Coronavirus also threw a spanner in the works for us for our outreach and education because we had plans to travel around our country on our mobile whales on the wheels to raise awareness about marine mammals as well as their conservation status. And with things hopefully returning more to normal in the coming months, we hope that we will be able to resume this work um, and to make up for the lost time this year that we could not do more outreach work. And a paper recently published uh, by two people that I really respect, conservationists, with the title, Healing the Wounds of Marine Mammals by Protecting Their Habitat. It was very timely for us because it was a reminder that if we protect the habitats of our beloved dolphins, porpoises, dugongs, whales, then we can eliminate many of the threats that they face and ensure their survival. Our field sites are internationally recognized as important marine mammal areas, and we need to safeguard those habitats. The process may be long and complicated, but at Mariset, we are com committed to keep working to ensure that we get to the destination of getting these habitats protected through our science, through our outreach and education, through our policy advocacy, as well as community capacity building. I just want to end by saying we owe it to our children to be better stewards of the environment because the alternative is a world without whales and that's just too terrible to imagine. Here at Maraset, we have loved and harbored dreams of becoming dolphin conservationists since we were children. So to imagine a world now without whales and dolphins would really be tragic. Thank you so much for your time today. We hope you've enjoyed our talk. Please continue to support us and follow us on social media. Bye.